Welcome back to the Bridge Club podcast. This is your host, Ruffin. Today, I'm chatting with Miri Buckland, the co-founder and COO of Landing soon to be Zine. Miri co-founded Landing with her Stanford Business School classmate, Ellie, and they've since built the product to nearly 1 million downloads and raised over $9 million in venture capital funding from investors like Cowboy and Defy Ventures. In this episode, we talk about everything from how to know when it's time to pivot to advice on applying to business school and strategies for running an effective fundraise. So without further ado, let's jump into it. So you started landing at Stanford Business School. What was your career before Stanford and what led you to business school in the first place? Great question. It feels like a really long time ago now, which is crazy to say. It's been five years since I graduated from GSB. So that time has just like absolutely flown by. Um, But before business school, I was living in London. I'm from London. I grew up there. Um, I was working at a company called Sky, which is Europe's largest pay TV company. So they sell TV packages, they make content, they also sell mobile and um, broadband too. Um, And I was in the strategy team there, so kind of like an internal strategy consultant. And I loved it, honestly. It gave me a really good view into how big companies work and what a business really, how it really functions, um, which I didn't think I really knew before that. Um, So I was doing everything from making board decks to competitor analysis, like partnerships analysis, um, working with the movies and sports teams to value content rights. And yeah, I really loved it. I I had a great team. I got to see how a big business worked. I learned some like really fundamental skills, like how to use Excel and PowerPoint and make slide decks. (laughs) But I also like had this real itch to explore startup world and to go much earlier stage. I think I was always, I was working at the big incumbent that was like a super successful company. And I kept being like really intrigued by like the scrappy challenges. And at that point it was like Netflix and Amazon who were challenging Sky in the TV space. And I kind of wanted to be on that other side. And actually even before I was at Sky for undergrad, I studied economics and management. And so I'd kind of done some of the management side of what you cover in an MBA. And I was really interested in the modules I took around like the psychology of business and how you build a brand and like why is culture important. But I studied it as an undergrad and I felt like I didn't have any professional experience to apply to it. So it always felt like something I might want to come back to later in life once I'd been working for a little bit. So it was kind of like those two things collided. Like I wanted to explore startups and a potential career pivot. And I wanted to go back to like studying the management side. And so that led me to exploring the MBA and it really felt like moving to Silicon Valley, immersing myself in that world was like the right way to explore that career pivot um, and to make that change into like startup world. I really like hadn't um, planned on starting my own company. So that was never really in my (laughs) in my plan or like vision. Um, But I knew that I wanted to be kind of closer to the action of startups than I was in London. When you were applying to business schools, did you consider other schools or was like Stanford really your main target? Because I know when I was like looking at different schools, I ended up at UCLA for business school. But for example, like I applied to Duke, Duke's business school, and someone literally told me like, you shouldn't go here if you want to do anything entrepreneurial because it's more of like a cutthroat consulting, investment banking type of track. So curious if you looked into other schools as options. I applied to Harvard and to INSEAD as well. So I was always sure that I wanted to go abroad. So I had always wanted to live abroad. I wanted to experience something different to my undergrad. So I was never really interested in applying to the UK based schools. Um, but I didn't really know a lot about the different schools, honestly, and I wish I'd done more research. Um, but I went to as many of the events that they hosted in London as I could. And I remember I went to a GSB panel and it was like a female panel where they were talking about their time at GSB. And I just thought these women were like the most badass people I'd ever seen. (laughs) And I was like, oh my God, they absolutely all love their experience. They're doing such interesting things, like not just in startups or founding companies, but they were just like great people. And I was like, I want to go there. I want to like go and learn from people like them. Any advice for listeners who might be applying to a top program like Stanford Business School um, in terms of like the application process and how you can stand out and get accepted into such a great program like that? The GMAT is not as 
bad as you think it might be. <laughs> it does require like a lot of prep, but um, I think people really tried to scare me about the GMAT and it wasn't, it wasn't so bad. But in terms of the application, I think just really try and be yourself. I think Stanford in particular really cares about getting to know you as a person and there's no like right way to write your application. And that was very, very different to what I experienced in applying to UK universities in particular, where it was very much more based on your um, academic achievements and there was much less of a kind of personal approach. So I think in applying there, at least to Stanford, I think just try and really be yourself. Don't try and fit the mold of um, what you think they want. And the Stanford um, application question is like, what matters most to you and why? And I think one of my most amazing like takeaways from being at Stanford was learning everybody's different responses to that question and how different they were. And it wasn't just like, you know, having, building a massive business or like, you know, some of the things you might expect from an MBA. It was like family and friends and where I'm from and like really personal answers to that question. So I think really just try and stay true to who you are and, and share that with the team. Can you share what yours was? As I said, I was working at Sky and the tagline for Sky was like, believe in better. And I talked about how when I joined, I thought that that was kind of cringy, honestly, and a bit cheesy. And then I thought about how believing in better, believing how people can be better, believing how I can be better, believing how we can leave the world better was like actually a really important part of my life and like the drive behind what everything I'm doing. So there's a little bit about that story and how I came from thinking it was really cheesy to actually thinking it was quite meaningful. So you got to Stanford Business School, you originally came in not knowing that you wanted to start a company. So how did you eventually land on wanting to build landing, you know, what kinds of things were you involved with during school that kind of led you to that path? Yeah, as I said, it was pretty unexpected. So um, I met my co-founder, Ellie. So that's probably the first piece of the puzzle. Um, I met her at GSB and she is like beautifully creative. She's definitely the person who everyone went to for advice on how to furnish their dorms to make it feel less like a hotel and more like a home. <laughs> Um, and I promise that's relevant to the story, but um, we actually ended up on a road trip together. We were friends. We ended up on a road trip together one weekend, spending like 16 hours in the car over one weekend, just the two of us. And we talked about everything from, you know, family life to like where we, where we came from and like how we ended up at GSB. And um, we actually realized how much of a pain point this was for people of our generation who are moving around all the time like how hard it was for them to translate a Pinterest board of all the things that they love into reality um, when it came to interior design. And Ellie was like the friend who everyone asked for help. And I was the friend always asking for help. Um, so we kind of brought those two things together and we both really wanted to take this class at GSB called Startup Garage, which is actually where DoorDash was started. A bunch of different companies have come out of it. And it's like a really kind of hands-on immersive class where you come in with an idea and then you go through this whole design thinking um, curriculum where you learn about you learn about the industry, you like do a ton of user interviews, you test a lot of different ideas for solutions. And we both really want to take that class. And so we started creating this um, application around the problem of moving and furnishing and creating a space that felt like home. Um, so really that was all it was at the beginning and then during the class we really dove into that kind of design thinking way of working we went to ikea with clipboards and like asked people about what they were trying to do <laughs> we made like endless kind of mvp solutions where we were trying to help our classmates furnish their dorms or furnish their apartment for the summer um, a lot of which was on like Google Slides. And we did a lot of just like talking to users. And the first iteration of landing was really all about like, how can we make it super easy to go end to end from like idea to installing the furniture and decor in your apartment or your dorm room. So we made these kind of um, curated decor and furnishing packs. We could just pick a pack of like a bed with a couch, with a plant and a rug. And they were all from different brands. Um, and we started selling those to our classmates. Um, so that was the very first, the very first version. And then that evolved into a website where we created this marketplace of furniture and decor items, but also a collaging tool to allow you to visualize the bed with the rug with the plant all together, all from different brands. 
Um, so that was where landing really started. It was like, how can we empower you to feel creative and feel confident in furnishing a space that really feels like you, um, by providing you with the tools to do that. Um, so that was, that was the very first, very first version of landing, which again, feels like years ago now. <laughs> I think a lot of people kind of like automatically go to, oh, I'm going to like partner with a few influencers and creators that have audiences, but it's so true. Like for that to really work, I think you really have to build out like long-term relationships with creators and financially at the early stage of companies, like a lot of times that just like doesn't totally make sense. So I think it's super st smart, the strategy that your team used. You're so right. It has to be like a long-term relationship and like someone who genuinely loves the platform and I think that that you, people can tell that when somebody posts a content about a new platform and um, I think people more and more see straight through just like paid um, one off partnerships. And so for us, it was like, OK, we'll just invest in the people who do genuinely love what we're doing and help them share about it. Can you share a bit more around like the incentives that you gave these creators and users of landing? Was it like monetary or just like kind of putting them on your social platforms or kind of what was the value that they got by partnering with your team? We knew that um, our community really valued learning about how to go viral and that's something we could give them. So we hopped on Zooms with them, we made them toolkits, we like taught them how to do that. We knew that they also really valued time with our team. So it was making ourselves available and answering questions and like teaching them about how we were building landing. And then they also value being amplified by us. So it was reposting things and sharing things. And yeah, it was also monetary compensation for people who had made amazing content that obviously we would pay for. So um, yeah, that was, it was a combination of all of those things. And I think that only worked because those people were already so invested in the platform and it wouldn't have worked if we were just like asking anyone and everyone to come and post and we'll pay them. So you mentioned a few times the strategies that your team uses to go viral. I would say like most founders and even investors today are like trying to understand how to create content on the internet and create viral content. Any like tips that you would share kind of with listeners on, you know, how to create great content? I think what's really worked for us is like the just rapid iteration and very, very analytical, like learning on what's working or not. So often what Greta and Liz would do is come up with like a calendar of just like tons of different hooks we could try in different content formats and then very, very systematically test them, posting like a large volume of content, content so like multiple TikToks or Reels a day, um, and then like really analyzing what's working, what's not. Um, we often found it helpful to start new accounts and to try creating different types of content on new accounts so we could kind of step out of the niche that we had been put in in the algorithm. Um, and then we would also really systematically use different hashtags um, to kind of like align ourselves with what was trending. Um, so yeah, it's really just a lot of experimentation, I would say. Um, so a few things also that worked for us were like really showing the app and showing it on a screen, not just talking about it. Things like that, that you won't just like know or like be able to anticipate but like once you start doing it you can like start to build your own recipe for what works and i think that'll be super different for different companies whether it's software or hardware i feel like a lot of it is th throwing a lot of things at the wall but then also looking at like the analytics on the back end understanding what did work and then like really leaning into those different lanes where things are working for you. And like you do this too, like the comments are also like the most important place to be, right? Like you can learn so much in the comments and you can also like really impact like the trajectory of a video in the comments. So always be in the comments. <laughs> comments can get wild, but they're also a lot of fun. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Just walk me through your process, like at graduation, like where were you with landing and how did you decide, you know, we want to go full time on this business and then what were your next steps after graduation? Like, did you find technical talent? Did you go out and fundraise? Kind of what was the journey? So when we were at Stanford, we took Startup Garage at the business school. And then we also took a class at the design school at Stanford called Launchpad, which was awesome because that was even more like a accelerator. So we had to actually incorporate the business. We had to like actually set it up. We had to actually try and make sales. We had to actually pitch investors. And so it was like really this boot camp in like, this being a real thing. And I think before that, we hadn't really treated it, we had, but like not properly treated it as something that we were definitely gonna do after school. 
And I remember in like our third quarter of second year, Ellie and I kind of looked at each other and we were like, you aren't recruiting for like a real job, are you? (laughs) And uh, neither of us were, thankfully. So um, we decided, you know, like we have momentum here. Um, We were lucky enough to have people asking to angel invest. And so we had the opportunity to like really give it a go. And I think most importantly, we had conviction that there was a need here. So we had spent, you know, three quarters of our um, second year of business school, like really trying to validate that need through user testing, user interviews, like building and iterating. And so I think we, we were able to make that decision at a point where like we had some data and some traction. Um, but then that first summer after business school was like, kind of crazy because we were still doing a whole end to end furnishing solution. So we were not only doing like the digital collaging and design piece, we were also ordering everybody's furniture that they were they were buying, collecting it in a warehouse in San Francisco, picking it up in a U-Haul ourselves, and then driving it to people's apartments and building their furniture for them. So we spent our first two months after graduating our MBAs, like literally building furniture. And we did like 200 pieces of furniture, I think that summer. And <laughs> I've never driven a U-Haul again. I think I'm like slightly scarred. Um, but it was like the real like in the trenches startup experience. Um, and I'm so glad we did it because we learned so much about what people were going through when they were creating a space and furnishing a space, which informed a lot of the software that we built later. And it also informed us not building the logistical part of the of the product, which was like the delivery and one day install that we had an idea about, because that wasn't what was like the magic moment for people. And it wasn't what people were willing to pay for. So we only really discovered that by hacking it together, and doing it ourselves for a couple of months. That's like a true startup experience. I love that so much. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny to think back on now when it's a very, very different company and product. <laughs> Can you share a little bit about how you first like approached angel investors um, and you've since raised a couple million dollars from VC investors like Cowboy Ventures and Defy Ventures? What has been your strategy for fundraising um, and how have you kind of approached investors? We've actually now raised about nine million across our different rounds. Um, we just raised a recent round from um, Peter Boyce at Stellation Capital, which is super exciting. So yeah, we've raised a number of rounds. We've raised angel rounds, we've raised institutional rounds, and we've obviously like been around for a while. So it's been an awesome learning curve, honestly. I think, you know, when we started out, we were raising from people we knew, um, angel networks, obviously being at business school is a huge help there. And I definitely don't take that for granted. Like we were in a really fortunate position of having an amazing network um, to be able to tap into through Stanford. Um, so that's how we kind of started with our angels. Um, and then each angel has an amazing network too. And that helped us also get on the radar of some funds. So um, yeah, we started in a really um, amazing place and we feel really lucky for that. Um, And then ever since, we've really approached it from a perspective of like, what does the business actually need? And not trying to treat fundraising as like milestones to aim for necessarily as much as like, what does our business actually need to be the best it can be in this next phase or this next chapter? And like raising the next round or fundraising um, in a VC world is not always the right answer for every business. And I think that there's a bit of a misconception of that. Anyway, that's a whole other topic. But things that have worked, <laughs> things that have worked well for us have been really thinking about the timing of the fundraise. So um, I think it's really important to fundraise when you have momentum on your side. So whether that's after a big launch or a, a huge growth period, like really trying to think about when is the right time to go to market so that you can make it as like an efficient a process as possible. Um, I've really, really lent also on my founder network for fundraising. So I think the best uh, intro you can get is someone from a portfolio company, a portfolio um, of an investor introducing you. So um, really asking for help, asking for intros to different found- from different founders and also offering them myself. Um, and then what else? I think for me, yeah, a lot of it comes down to running a really tight process. Like there is so much of fundraise that comes down to just being really good at like basically running a sales funnel, like coming up with a really strong top of funnel list, like honing your pitch and then like managing the whole process from start to finish and not letting any of the balls drop. Um, and it's really like an endurance sport. So I, I kind of think for people and like humans as founders, like you know this, it's like you have to figure out what is 
what is going to make you the best you can be in that process and you need to be able to survive like a lot of rejection and a lot of no's and sometimes you might just need to be like yeah the thing I need is like to go outside for an hour or I need to like ask for help or I need to like do something to make me feel better and so I think knowing that and knowing yourself is like really really important. How do you manage um, the fundraise with your co-founder Ellie like do you take all the pitch calls do you divide and conquer and then like any like specific tools you use to manage that sales process or is it like simply you have like a Google spreadsheet or something like that? We use a Google spreadsheet or Notion for just like a tracker and it's a pretty robust tracker. Like we're both pretty um, <laughs> dedicated to it, I would say. Um, we're pretty good about it, very diligent. Um, but yeah, we just like have a simple tracker and then we share it with our investors to like, you know, um, add their ideas and, and interests they can make and stuff like that. But yeah, Ellie and I divide and conquer. So I'm in New York and she's in San Francisco. And so that's actually been great because we can have boots on the ground in um, two awesome markets of fundraising. Um, and then we typically take our first call solo and then we'll bring the other one in if, and when we progress to like further stages with people. For both of us, it's really important that each person has met the people who we are considering as investors because we really want to get to know those people and um, them to get to know both of us as well. So how have you navigated the pivots over the years, including having that conversation with investors? Any advice for other founders who might be navigating similar conversations? I think the first thing is like, don't freak out. Like pivots are normal <laughs> uh, at this stage. And I think they are far more common than most people think. And I always think that like, really early stage investors, like pre-seed investors, they're investing in you and they're investing in the problem space and almost like last on the list is the solution that you're actually pitching at that time. So I think it's more important for you to be focused on building the right thing than the thing that you said at the beginning you were gonna build. Um, so that is helpful framing, but um, I think in terms of actually bringing people along, it's all about how do you like actually share everything you've learned and ground the pivot in like learnings and iteration and experimentation you've done not just like a brand new idea that you've plucked out of thin air so we were always like really really purposeful about that of like not just being like surprised we're pivoting but you know sharing in our monthly investor updates on email like learnings that month and what's going well what's not going well so that it's not ever a surprise that like we're moving in a new direction. And I would say that that means that all of our pivots have mostly been like a series of small pivots rather than one big change at once. And to that point, you have a upcoming pivot. Um, you're actually closing down landing and relaunching Zine to create a more sustainable business model. So can you share a bit more around your thinking there, the decision process and you know, how Zine is going to be different. It's so funny, like talking about the origins of landing and now like also talking about Zine in the same sense. This is the first podcast where I've ever like talked about it. So um, yes, firstly, to frame a bit of context, Zine, I'll describe what Zine is. So Zine is a shoppable and visual blog. So it's a web platform where as a creator, you can create, publish and earn affiliate revenue from your visual blog. And you can incorporate collages, kind of like how on landing you can make collages and also incorporate affiliate links. So you can think of it a little bit like your own mini magazine or like a very visual version of Substack. Um, and as a reader, you can subscribe to zines um, that you love. You can follow creators that you love and you can shop directly from their zine posts. So we're launching in October, early access in September. If anybody wants to be on the wait list, follow landing.space on Instagram and we'll post it there soon. Um, but it's built by the same landing team um, and it basically leverages everything that we learn about creativity and community on landing and some of the core landing features like being able to make collages, um, but brings it into a more like fashion focused and like shopping focused format. So we're really excited about it. And it's been this really, you know, bittersweet moment where, you know, we've built landing to over a million users entirely organically and we're so proud of it. Um, and yet we had to kind of face the reality that ultimately the path from like that million users to a billion users wasn't clear. Um, and while we built a platform that was awesome for people who love collaging and a community around that, it wasn't clear that that market was big enough or enough of a need to have daily use case to sustain a massive monetizable business. So as a company, we had to be super clear eyed about that and determine 
what product and what strategy would actually enable us to unlock that billion users and our mission of empowering creativity for the next gen of creators. Um, so it's it's definitely bittersweet. I think, you know, we are we are really proud of landing and the community there. And we're also really excited about Zine. Um, it felt like a really hard decision, um, but we also feel so strongly that Zine needs to be built and needs to be built in this year, in like 2024, it feels like the right time. Um, so mixed feelings, very grateful, very proud, and very excited about Zine all at the same time. Were you going after like, an advertising model with landing in terms of the business model or what was kind of your original vision for monetization there? We had a number of options on the table. I think it could have been an ads model if it had scaled like beyond uh, the million users. I think for an ads model, you really do have to have just such a large user base. Um, I think we could have introduced like a premium model where people paid for subscription features. Um, I think we also we were always thinking about commerce and how you could layer commerce into boards. And ultimately that just felt like a bit too much of a stretch from where we were with landing as a collaging and social collaging platform, even though we saw so much demand in certain verticals like fashion for the ability to shop from those collages. So I think really Zine is a way to kind of create a new brand and a new platform that is really centered around that from the beginning and allows people to create and shop from these collages in a way that like didn't necessarily fit on landing as a whole. You're doing a lot. You're also a venture partner at Unshackled Ventures. Um, one, can you just explain to people what a venture partner is? Yeah, because I feel like that's just a term I see all the time. And it's like, huh, what is that? Um, and then like, what are you focused on investing in there? And how did you get involved with the team? And I also think like venture partner probably means a hundred different things, a hundred different funds. So I'll define what it means <laughs> at Unshackled, but um, so just a little bit of background on Unshackled, they're an early stage venture capital fund that enable um, unrecognized and excluded immigrant founders to start companies in the US. So they've invested in over 80 companies and over 200 founders to date. And they were one of the very first investors in landing. So Manan and Nitin, the partners there, have been with us since literally day zero through all of these pivots um, and supported me. Yeah, like through literally everything. Um, and they really supported me on my immigration journey too. Like I'm British and so starting a company in the US is not always that straightforward. Um, and they have really helped me figure that out. So um, I was already singing from the rooftops about Unshackled and telling everyone I knew about what, what they do and how amazing they are as investors, but also as um, people who can support your immigration journey. And they started this program called Venture Partners, which is a group of seven founders from their portfolio who are collaborating with them just to amplify their mission and bring more immigrant founders into their network. Um, I really think they're like exceptional investors. And um, so I'm really focused on helping them bring in more consumer founders, community building founders, um, and anyone in the kind of like social commerce space. As we start to wrap things up. Can you share a female founder, investor, or leader who inspires you and a bit about why? So I was actually listening to a podcast the other day with Lindsay Carter from Set Active. Um, I don't know if you know her, but I think her story, yeah, like her story, I've never met her and I'm like slightly obsessed. So maybe I should try me here, but um, her whole story has been about like being community oriented from the beginning. And I just love that. I think they've done a phenomenal job of actually walking the walk in that and enlisting their community to design collections, model their product collections. I think they even ran a scavenger hunt in LA recently to gift customers products. I'm like, that is just the coolest thing. Um, so they're really, really good at um, organic community led marketing. And um, that's something that obviously we've had a lot of fun with at Landing. And I really look up to them um, and how they how they really bring their community into the fold. Um, and the podcast was with um, Jasmine Gonsworthy of the Female Founders um, World. So she, yeah, she did a really good job interviewing Lindsay. She's built a very loyal, engaged community. Um, and like, I feel like people are just obsessed with the brand, which is really cool to see. Yeah, totally. Finally, where can ever, everyone find you? Where can people find Landing or Zine? So I'm at Mary Buckland on socials and LinkedIn. Um, landing is at landing.space on Instagram and TikTok. 
and um, you can follow along there. We will be switching those accounts over to Zine in a few weeks. So stay tuned for more updates and we'll be posting the wait list for Zine there soon too. Well, thank you so much for joining the show and I can't wait to see the launch of Zine and check it out. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me. This is fun.